So those of you who are watching this on our on YouTube or on our website, uh, there's a teaching that's part of the homework called Paul's Thorn in the Flesh. Mm -hmm. So if you go to our website, teachofthebible.com, you can download that so you can complete the homework assignment. And we're going to cover it briefly here in this class today. So uh, for all of you here, um, one of your homework assignments is going to be to uh, read through Paul's thorn in the flesh. Uh, this is a question that is asked a lot. It's a very sincere question. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Some people think it was a sickness. Some people try to tie it in with Galatians 4 that he had an eye disease and all that. And so in this teaching, we try to explain exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. And you're going to see it was not an eye disease and uh, it wasn't something that he was sick of. And so uh, the way I did this teaching was about 15 years ago, uh, when we almost, well, maybe it was more than that, like 20 years ago, somebody sent me an email when email was first, first starting and uh, asked me what happened with Paul in his thorn in the flesh. Was it a sickness? And so what this is, is this guy, we went back and forth and I answered his question. So these are all the emails <laughs> and I just organized it in such a way that uh, it would be a, a one teaching on one section, so in one area. So this is Paul's thorn in the flesh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight when we get over to First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. So let's go ahead and take our notes now, and we are going to talk about physical healing in the epistles, uh, the apostolic letters. This is going to be another reason why we believe healing is for today. Because why would it be written in the New Testament as instruction for us if it all just died out with the apostles? Right. What was the whole point of writing it in the letters if we're supposed to um, no longer have healing? That's false. And people say, well, healing was strictly for the apostles. And yet James right away, we're going to see James right away say, no, actually, you can just call the elders of the church and they can minister healing. You don't have to call any apostles. So, All right, so let's go to the top of page 104 and let's review briefly what we said um, last week. In Acts 14, uh, we studied the healing of the lame man from Lystra. Paul went over the guy didn't uh, ask for healing, but Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. So he commanded the man to stand up and be healed, and he was healed. In Acts 16, uh, Paul was confronting this slave girl that had, she was possessed by an evil spirit. And the Greek word there is spirit of python, puthon. Uh, so she had a divining uh, spirit, a witchcraft. She was involved in witchcraft. And so Paul, in the name of Jesus, commanded the spirit to come out of the girl. Again, the girl did not ask to be delivered. And Paul did it anyway. <laughs> um, in another instance, which we did not cover, and I didn't want to cover it because Paul made somebody sick. <laughs> um, if you remember, Elymas, the sorcerer, was opposing Paul as he was trying to win Sergius Paulus to the Lord. And... Uh, when uh, Elymas continued to resist Paul, Paul uh, said, you're a child of the devil, and he smote him with blindness. And so Elymas left there kind of um, completely blind. Uh, but what happened was because that happened, Sergius Paulus got saved. He saw what Paul did, and he still got saved. So the end result was that Sergius Paulus got saved. So even though Elymas tried to resist that, he still ended up keeping his heart to the Lord. In Acts 19, uh, you remember God did unusual miracles with, uh, through Paul that even handkerchiefs and aprons that went from his body, his that touched his skin, went and brought healing to people. So that was a very powerful thing. In Acts 20, Eutychus was listening to Paul speak. It was late at night and Paul kept going on and on and he ended up falling out of that third floor window. He, he was killed, died from that fall, and Paul went, ministered to him, and he was raised from the dead. 
in Acts 28, the final area we looked at, uh, when Paul got onto the island of Malta. Um, if you remember when they, it was raining, it was cold, and they made a fire, and a poisonous viper came out of the fire and bit Paul, and Paul shook off that poisonous snake right into the fire, and uh, it opened up the door then for healing to the leading man there, probably the governor or whatever, the leader that was in that uh, island nation. His father was sick of fever and dysentery. Paul laid hands on him, prayed for him, he got healed. And when that happened, it opened the door for everybody on that island that was sick, came to Paul, and they were all healed. So that was a very powerful time of healing that the whole island of Malta got completely cleaned out of sickness and disease and evil spirits. So that was very powerful. So tonight we want to start with, uh, I believe, a major uh, teaching of healing, and that's in the book of James. <clears throat> and we've covered this before, but not in this context. Let's go to James chapter 5, and uh, let's see what the Apostle James here says about healing. And he's very specifically talking about physical healing. James chapter 5, and let's begin with, with verse uh, 13, and um, why don't we go ahead and read down to verse 18 instead of 16, just to grab the whole context here of prayer. Uh, this, uh, from verses 13 down to verse 18, you're going to see the word prayer, 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 all the way through, and so he's talking about the importance of prayer in the life of the church. So let's read it here. It says, Is any among you suffering? And then he commands us in Greek. It's a Greek imperative verb. I command you, go pray. So if you're in trouble, I think one translation says, if you're in trouble, what should you do? Pray. Go pray. pray. If you're happy or cheerful, he commands this, what should you do? Start yes. praising the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Let him sing songs, let him go sing psalms, uh, songs of praise. But now notice what he says, is anyone among you sick? Now he commands this to be done. You would think he would say, go pray. Well, he doesn't say that. Obviously, if you're sick, go pray. Everybody here, go pray. If you're sick, go pray. Any of us, when we get sick, we go pray. But he says, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Both of those are Greek imperative verbs. He commands the person to do that, and he commands the elders to pray over them. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So there we have the authority again. You're using the authority of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and it's the Lord who will raise him up. So the Lord does the healing. All of these are confirming what we saw all along in the healing ministry teachings that we've been doing. And he says, and if, there's a big if, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So he says, confess your trespasses to one another. And notice this, and pray for one another that you may be healed. So we have two groups of people here who are praying for healing. The first are the elders in verse 14. And the second is the whole community of believers are also praying for healing. And they can also pray for other people to be healed. And then he says this powerful statement, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I think the NIV says it's powerful and effective. And now he's going to give you an example of what effective and fervent prayer is like. Who does he pick? He picks Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man, and I love this, he had the same nature like ours. He was just like us. And I, as you guys know, when you think of Elijah, you think of a, like a guy that's on steroids spiritually. You know, you think of a guy that's super, like super anointed. You know, and you don't think of him as being a guy who's just like us. We put him on a pedestal. Uh, because he called fire. I mean, Elijah really was a powerful prophet, and he called down fire many times, and he called down fire on Mount Carmel. He called down fire and burned up all those people that kept coming to try to get him. 
And so he was, he was really supernatural. I mean, when you take your coat off and you hit the Jordan River and it splits wow. open, you know you got power yeah. from God. And so yeah. right away, I mean, if Elijah came through right now, like, oh, wow. like whoa, <laughs> you're anointed, man. And it just says, well, he was just a guy like us. Yeah. And guess what? When Jezebel confronted him, you remember he ran. He ran. Yeah. And he ran and he ran and he ran for 40 days. And he ended up in a cave at Mount Hora. And he says, I'm no better than anybody else. I want to die. <laughs> I want to die. Here's this anointed man. And all he, he was so depressed that he just wanted to die. And so we, he comes back down to earth here um, when we see that he was a man with a nature just like us. And so if we will always keep that in mind, that this guy was powerful because he was anointed by the Spirit of God. That's why he was powerful. Yeah. It's the same thing with Samson. I know I say this many times. I don't know whether you guys really believe it or not. But Samson was not a buffed guy that worked out at the gym every day. Okay? Because what he was able to do, 20 NFL linemen could not do what he did by himself. And you can't do that. You can't even get a semi truck to do what he did. You know, for him to rip off city gates right. that weigh thousands right. of pounds. I mean, thousands of pounds, maybe 10,000 10, pounds. No, no one can lift that. No, no one can even have body bones that could hold that up. But he put them on his shoulders and he climbed from Gaza to all the way to Horeb, which is 60 miles away. Okay, so he's carrying these, these gates 60 miles uphill, and he throws them by the city gates of Horeb. So you can't, you can't even do that with a Toyota truck, <laughs> let alone with, with 20 other men. So don't tell me he was buffed. And he had all these really, you know, he was really, he was working out at the gym every week, you know. He was, what does the Bible say? The Spirit came on him. 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 And for him to push those giant pillars that were holding 3,000 people, for him to push them and knock them over, right. you, you, can't, you can't even do that with a truck. You can't push those pillars down. And he did it with his hands, you know. And so we again have to go back to this. He was anointed by God. That's why he did it. But here's one thing where we can be like him. It says that he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Wow. And it did not rain on the land for three, and a, three years and six months. But then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So that's powerful. So you can stop things. And you can start things with prayer. You can stop things and you can start things if you pray. And we just need to pray fervently, effectively. And how many of you know the same God Elijah served is the same God we serve? Yes. Yes. In fact, as I understand it, we even have more favor because we're under grace of God. We're not under law. We're under grace. We have God's favor. We have God's open heavens really to us. And so, uh, but anyway, that was powerful. He was a powerful person. So prayer is powerful and prayer has results that Amen. will bring healing Amen. to us. Okay, so James says, uh, or talks a lot about prayer in these verses, right? Let him pray, verse 13. Pray over him, verse 14. The prayer of faith, verse 15. Pray for one another and fervent prayer, verse 16. He prayed earnestly, verse 17. And he prayed again, verse 18. These are powerful statements of prayer. And I love this too, as we read verse 13. What happens? When things are going bad, pray. When things are going good, praise. But no matter whether it's bad or good, God is your focus. Yes. God is the one you're looking to. Amen. Right? It's so bad, Pastor Charlie. It is bad for me right now. Go pray. Yeah. And then you might tell me, Hallelujah, man. Give me a high five. Jesus is good and all that. Go yeah. praise the Lord, you know. Yeah. But whether you're down in the dumps or you're happy as, a, as whatever, 
God is your focus. Praise the Lord or help me, Lord. <laughs> Either one. So one day you might be happy and the next day it might not be going very good for you. But in each case, we either pray or we praise. That's what's awesome. God is always going to help us and sustain us. So the NLT says, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. And are any of you happy? You should sing praises to God. So we'll have both in the church at any one time, as you know. And that could be the case in your own life. Okay, top of page 105. So he asks here in the NLT, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Amen. He commands this to be done. Let them call and let them pray are both Greek imperative verbs of command. So he's commanding that this be done. So notice it says, not if you're sick, you should pray. Obviously, everybody's going to pray when they're sick, right? We all go pray, right? But he gives this instruction. If you're sick, you should call for the elders and let them pray. So you kind of join forces together in a sense. And you're praying together, and the Lord will raise you up. Wearsby says, keep in mind that it is not one individual who is praying. It is the body of elders, spiritual men of God, who seek God's will and pray. James does not instruct the believer to sin for a faith healer. <laughs> the matter is in the hands of the leaders of the local church. You know, that's what happens, right? A lot of times... We're looking for the guy for the TV evangelist that seems to be really anointed. We're going to go to his crusade. Uh, well, why don't you just call grandma? <laughs> why don't you just call the elders of the church? And the same God that's working through that person is working through them. You know, there's one, one of our brothers here in the church who's always exhorted us with this scripture, and that's been Mike Martin. And uh, one day... Uh, Mike, he's a real firm believer in this verse right here. He really believes that this uh, verse works. And so Mike called me. He was at home in his condo over there by Fresno Pacific. And he said, I am bleeding profusely and I can't stop. And he says, that, uh, and can you come over here because I'm getting ready to go to the hospital. And um, so, you know, when people call me with those I just have to tell you, sometimes I, I feel like a man of faith and power, and sometimes I feel like a man of paste and flour. Right, right, right. <laughs> sometimes I feel up to it, and sometimes I don't, you know, and when they call me out of the blue, come, I'm bleeding profusely, I'm getting ready to go to the hospital, I almost want to say, brother, call the ambulance right now, you know. But I remember that Mike believes in that, so I drove from my, I, I don't know what I was doing, I don't remember. <laughs> I drove all the way over to his house, and uh, I brought oil with me. I anointed him right there in his bedroom, in his, uh, in his living room area where the couches are. I laid hands on him in the name of Jesus, and I walked away. I don't know whether I even had that much faith, but I did. I did what the Bible said to do. And I read, we read these scriptures when we did it, laid hands on him. And what he did, rather than go to the hospital, he went to his doctor, and when he got to the doctor, he was totally healed by the time he got there. And the doctor just checked him out. He was completely well, and he walked away, and he called me up uh, that evening or whatever, and he said, that, thank you for coming over. The Lord healed me. But you know what? He put his faith in the Lord that yes. these scriptures yes. are true, yes. and God honored his faith. Yes. And so Mike shares that testimony uh, a lot with people that, the Lord does hit this act who, uh, if you believe his word. So James responds to the issue of illness quite differently to his response to suffering. The name of Jesus is invoked in prayer as the power and the authority to act. Mm -hmm. And so it says right there, you saw that um, in verse uh, 14, we anoint them what? in the name of the Lord. That's the authority that we're using to minister. So here we have the authority combined with prayer. We lay hands on people and the Lord will raise them up, it says. Um, 
So one commentator says it's not just the fervency or the frequency of the prayer that renders it effective. It is the faith that we believe. And some of you here who are struggling physically, you have more faith than I do. You have very strong faith. And here it says it's the prayer of faith that will save the sick. So we pray believing that the Lord is going to do that. I remember one of the, the, the healing evangelists years ago who would always say, he goes, I would rather pray in faith for one minute than pray in unbelief for three hours. <laughs> you know, it, it, don't spend a lot of time just, oh, hopefully God, hopefully you'll be able to do this. No, let's pray in faith even if it's for one minute, you know. And so the prayer of faith will save the sick person. Amen. So we, we are believing God. It is the Lord's action that does the healing. I love this. It's not the oil. It's not the hands. It's not the power of the elders. The Lord remains sovereign and He answers prayers. Okay, so God answers prayers when people believe Him and trust Him and they pray in faith. The Lord's the one that raises them up. Now, there's something here that's very important. And I want to highlight this word if. How many know if is a big word in the Bible? <laughs> There's a lot of ifs, you know. You'll, you'll get this if. <laughs> and here, what we want to say is, uh, because sometimes people have used these, these verses to say, okay, the reason you're sick is because you've been sinning, you know. And he says here, if he's committed sin, he will be forgiven. Not this is the reason why you're sick. So sometimes, sometimes uh, sickness is the result of somebody who sinned against the Lord. We saw that, right, in different uh, healings that were in the, in the um, Bible where the Lord told that one man, he says, hey, uh, you need to straighten out because something worse might come on you. And so, you, you, so sometimes it is. But we should never insist on it. When you go to pray for somebody, you should never insist. You know what? James says here that you've committed sin. You need to confess it right now. You know, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. They don't even know. Maybe they don't even know what's going on. So we don't have to insist on it. But if they feel convicted about something, let them go ahead and confess. They'll be forgiven. Then lay hands on them, anoint them with oil, and they'll be healed. See so how both. And um, I, I want to get back to this now that we've done this class. But there was a time in my life where anyone that I pray for salvation, I always ask them if they were sick. And almost invariably, the people were sick. So I had them receive Jesus not only as Savior, I had them receive Him as healer. And we saw people get healed because when you're just giving your heart to the Lord, your faith is raw and fresh and it's right there. And the Lord just seems to do something special with people. And so when you lead people to the Lord, don't only ask them, if they need salvation, ask them if they need healing. Yeah. And God will open the door up for you. And I, we've done that on a lot of the outreaches. I've asked people, are you sick in your body? And you know, when you're out there and you're homeless, you're not taking care of yourself. You know, you've got problems with their feet. They've got just all kinds of issues going on with their body. And so a lot of those people are sick and they could use healing from the Lord. Um... <clears throat> All right, it is striking that in verse 14, the elders are to pray for healing. And then here in verse 16, the whole church body is to be involved in prayer for healing. And so we see here these themes of prayer and healing. Verse 15, the elders are praying for the sick. Verse 16, it's the whole community that are being encouraged to pray for each other and to confess to each other. Moose says this verse also demonstrates that the power to heal is invested in prayer, not just the elder. James makes it clear that all believers have the privilege and the responsibility to pray for healing. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that my wife and I have been doing for a while now is everyone that we know or aware of that are sick in the body, we pray for them every single day. And we're believing that there's going to be breakthroughs that are going to happen because a lot of people are praying. A lot of people are praying in our church. And so as we collectively pray together, it's not just the elders who are praying for healing. 
All of us are praying for the healing power of the Lord. And so it's powerful. And you guys have seen it in the women's ministry with all the prayer requests that go out. The Lord heals people when we pray for the sick. Uh, so James clearly uh, an epistle that um, teaches on healing. Now, uh, as you guys know, and it's one of those areas where I just pray for him, but John MacArthur, a very well-known preacher, and everybody likes him because mm -hmm. he's such a good teacher, but he doesn't believe in any of the healing stuff. The healing stuff died away. And so uh, I always wondered, how is he going to handle something like this, where this is clearly in the church, elders. It's not about apostles. They're laying hands on people, anointing them with oil. And, uh, you know, he writes a whole article dismissing all of this for healing, you know. And it's like, okay, you take all these other verses seriously in this book, but you get to that one and you put it off to the side. And so it makes me wonder then for him, what are we to believe and not to believe? What's good today and what's not good today? So people dance around these scriptures, but these scriptures are clearly teaching us that healing is for today. It's in a New Testament epistle, and we should practice what it's saying for us to do. So let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's look here at some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 12, I want to read two portions. The first one's here when he defines the spiritual gifts. <clears throat> and then the second portion is how the Lord has set healing in the church. He set miracles in the church. That was his doing. And once again, how can you argue with this? This has nothing to do with the apostles. These are gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is not about an apostle or some specially gifted person. These these can be done by people in the body. That's what the whole teaching of 1 Corinthians 12 is, is how the body has such diversity and not any one person has all the gifts. Uh, no, everybody has been given gifts yes. for the edification of the body of Christ. So that's very powerful. So perhaps maybe the Lord wants to raise up people here in our church to be used in some of these healing gifts. So let's read here. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, and what, let's just start with verse 1. What does he say? Brothers, concerning spiritual gifts, gifts I don't want you to be ignorant. I, I want you to know what they're about. I want you to know God is speaking. He's a God who speaks, and I want you to know these things. So he starts out in verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, that's Jesus. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God, the Father, who works all in all. So we have their spirit, Jesus, and God. So we have the Trinity right there, and it shows how they work in the life of people. But now he's going to focus specifically on verse 4 Starting in verse 7 here, he's going to show you the gifts of the Spirit. So, he says, but, let me show you, I've told you about Jesus and the Father, but let me tell you specifically about the manifestation of the Spirit. It's given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts, plural, of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working, and should be plural, workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But it's this one and same Spirit who works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Mm -hmm. It's what God, the Holy Spirit, wills. Now, uh, He's then going to talk about the body of Christ and how we're not all one big eyeball, or one ear, or one foot, or one hand. But no, God has made the body to have many members so each of the members can do different functions and we can also minister with different gifts. 
So if you go down to verse, well, let's go ahead and start with verse 27. For now you are the body of Christ and your members individually. And God has appointed, he has set, he's established these in the church. This is what God has put in the church. First apostles, second prophet, third teachers. And notice this, after that, he's put miracles and then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. So he says, are all apostles? No, he just got finished telling you that we're different right. gifts, different ability. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. And so on. Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. Oh, man, he says desire the best gifts. And yet I'm going to show you a more excellent way, which is obviously chapter 13 is the way of love. That's the excellent, the best mm -hmm. way is the way of love. Mm -hmm. yes. Agape. Because without agape, you don't got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here clearly, again, we're seeing that this is not about the apostles. <laughs> this is about the Holy Spirit. Because healing does not come through man. It comes through God. Yes. God alone. Yes. None of us here. If a fly got a headache, sorry, that fly's going to die. You can't do anything to help him. Because uh, none of us can heal. Only God can heal. So here, let's read verses, uh, uh, look at verses 4, 5, and 6. So notice the word diversities, differences, and varieties in each of these three verses. So even though in English they use different words, it's all the same Greek word underneath. Okay, so, uh, and basically what that means to distribute among many. Mm -hmm. So what God has done with gifts, with ministries, with uh, energizing you for, for activity, all of that, God has handed it out to different people, services, gifts, energizing you to do different things. God has distributed to everybody. So this same... As you read in verse 4, same Spirit, verse 5, same Lord, verse 6, same God, is the one triune God, the same Spirit, same Lord, same God, is the one who's working in us. So now he's focusing here on the gifts from the Spirit. The ministries, service, they're from the Lord, right? He gives gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, so on. So those come from Jesus. But what energizes all of this? It's God the Father. That's what the word there for uh, activities, where it says there is diversities of activities. So who energizes it all? Who works all? That word works there is energeo, where we get our word energy. Who energizes everything? God the Father does. So Paul is showing us here what part each person of the Trinity plays in the operation of many ministry gifts. The bottom line is there's diversity with unity. There's many gifts, but only one God. There's many spirit, there's many uh, spiritual gifts, but only one Holy Spirit. So there's always diversity with unity. Just like in your physical body, you have a bunch of different members, toes and fingers and elbows and all that. You have those, but there's just one physical body. All right, let's go to the next page, top of page 107. Here in verse 4, you see the word there, gifts. It's the word that you guys all know in English, charismata. Now, uh, the Greek word charis is the word for grace. Whenever you see the grace of God, the grace of the Lord, that's charis. Then charisma, you have the M-A, that means uh, gift. But then you add the T-A, that makes it plural. So gifts, grace gifts. Charismata means that God has given us gifts by His grace. That's always very important to, to know, right? Because God did not give it to you because you were super anointed or super, you're just awesome. You're just an awesome Christian. And God says, you know what? You're awesome. I'm going to give you an awesome gift. No, 
These have all been graciously given to us by God's grace. It wasn't your ability, it was God's grace and his favor for you. Paul is going to use the phrase same spirit five times in these next few verses. Verse 4, the same spirit. Verse 8, the same spirit. Verse 9, the same spirit. Verse 9 again, the same spirit. Verse 11, the same spirit. He wants all of us to always be aware that it's the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that we have, it's the same Spirit that's going to give us the gifts and move. And it's as He wills. Whatever He wants to do is it's how it's going to work. Now, I know you guys are, know all of those things, but I just want to be clear. So there's three things that we have here in verse 7. The first thing is, He says, the manifestation of the Spirit. So we were just talking in verse 4 about the Spirit, verse 5 about Jesus, verse 6 about God the Father. He goes, now, but now specifically, I want to show you how the Spirit manifests itself. You guys know we can't see the Holy Spirit. God is a Spirit. Uh, and you can't see the wind, but you can feel its effect. You can see its effect. And if you get a strong enough wind, it can knock down stuff. Mm -hmm. And you get a wind that starts twirling, you can have a hurricane and tornadoes. But if you want to see how the Spirit begins to manifest, He's going to show you right now. It's through spiritual gifts. A lot of them are speaking, but some of them are for healing. And then it says it's given to each one. If you look at the Greek Bible, it has that first. To each one, those are the first words of the text, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the profit of all. So he wants to emphasize that. When, they, when the Greek Bible does that, sometimes it'll put words that we find way in the back. He puts them way in the front. Each one of you has a spiritual gift. Each one of you here has spiritual gifts. It cannot be that God gives all the gifts to one person, and the rest of you, too bad, you're out of luck. Uh, we're just going to give all the rows, and we're all going to go to rows. Isn't that something? You've got to know how God's right. plan is, right? He doesn't want us all to go to rows. He wants us to go and be used with anybody here. Anybody can be used in prophecy, healings, and all that. And that's why when we run to all these healers, you know, Maybe we're missing the point. Maybe God wants to use just the people in our church bodies, the young, the small people that we are ignoring. But what is this for? This is not for us to develop our powerful and great ministry where we get on television and all that. What is it for? It's for the profit of everyone in the body. It's to bless people in the body. It's not for us to profit ourselves, even though God may promote us, it's for the profit of all the others. And that's why it's important. So, God wants to use you to bless others through the spiritual gifts. It was not for your profit and advantage, but for others. Certainly you will be blessed when you're used by God, but it's not about you. <laughs> Once you get that, man, God can really begin to use you. And I'm, I've been, you know, studying this stuff right now, I think... I used to pray all the time, God, use me in prophecy, because that's what he talks about here. God, use me in prophecy. Ask for that. And I got away from that. So we need to start praying. God, use us in the spiritual gifts that you've given us so we can be used for the edification of the body. All right, let's see. Where am I at? Oh, I was already ahead of you. Ah, sorry. I was, I was ahead. Uh, uh, reading from that one. Sorry. Okay, so once again, just summarizing, God's purpose is not to give one person online gifts. He wants many people involved, not just a few. So let's not be spectators, but let's be participants. You know? God wants to do this for the good. The gifts are not about you. It's not to build up a big, powerful ministry for you. It's about seeing people healed, delivered, set free, given direction, and so on. So we need to be available then, because it's not about us. It's awesome. And honestly, I think if you begin to think that way, Lord, use me 
to be a blessing to others, mm -hmm. how much more is God going to want to do that? Because he said, Lord, give me all of this for it for me. I want it all myself. No, <laughs> maybe you're not going to get that. But if it's going to be for others, maybe God is going to give it more to us. I think he will. Mm -hmm. Gifts of healing. So Paul mentions this gift, and he also mentions it, and we saw it in verses 40, uh, 28 and 30. It is a gift that God has placed in the church, and it's not, and not everyone has this gift, right? So he said that. Does everyone have this gift? No. Everybody doesn't have this gift, but some of us do, and so we need to be used. And it uses there, it says the word gifts, it uses the word healings and workings and discernings and kinds of tongues, all plural. You know why? Because there's such a diversity of need, there's such a diversity of illness, there's such a diversity of different spirits. And you might be able to discern one type of spirit, but not another, but somebody else might be able to discern something in somebody else. So God gives us that. He gives us plural, many different kinds of gifts and healings. How we need these gifts in the church today. And this is very specific to physical healing. It says they're gifts of healings. And we'll say more about it here when we get over to 1 Peter in just a moment about the need for healing. Um, the word there, in fact, for healing can be translated medicine or remedy. Maybe God is giving you a gift of medicine, a remedy for people, and God can use you to minister. So what do we have now? In James, we had a body of elders. and we James, we had a community of believers. And now we have specific people with healing gifts. So you're not limited to just one place. So you need to go to where God is directing you to go. And if he tells you to go to the elders, go to the elders. If he has you to call for prayer, ask for prayer. If he has you, you know somebody who has the gift of healing, you can go to that person and receive healing. So God has many different things, as you know, because there's so many different kinds of sicknesses and diseases, and God wants to heal them. In verse 10, there are five gifts that are listed here in this one verse, verse 10. And uh, one of those gifts, what are miracles or workers or workings of miracles? And he also mentioned it again down there. Uh, and I want to emphasize that, that God has placed this in the church. Miracles and gifts of healings. Right alongside with administrators and people who set up tables <laughs> and fill, set up chairs and do stuff behind the scenes. We got people who do that. And we have also people who speak in tongues, and we have people who do healings, and we have people who teach the word, and we have people who are prophetic people. So God has all these in the gift, gifts in the church for the edification of the church. So uh, the word there for miracles, as you see it in verse um, 10, and as you see it down there in verse 28, is a word that is used throughout the New Testament to talk about physical healings. And I've listed some verses there. Remember Acts 4, when that lame man got healed at the beautiful gate? It says it was an outstanding miracle. And verse uh, Acts 4.22, it says, It was a miraculously healed, this man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Same word is used right here. Jesus did miracles, Acts 2. Philip did miracles, Acts 8. Paul did unusual miracles, Acts 19. Paul and Barnabas did miracles, Acts 15. All those words are the exact same word as used here. All of those words are words for physical healing. Not just a miracle of salvation. Not when somebody gets saved and you say, oh, it's a miracle he got saved. No, we're talking physical healing miracles. Verse 11. Notice the wording here in verse 11. Also, it says to each one individually. The Spirit has a gift for each one of you. And He works and distributes these gifts as He wills. It's as He decides. It's as He determines. It's not about you. He knows the needs of the people. So we must be obedient, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, 
And let us ask him for discernment and wisdom on which gift the Spirit would exercise through us. So we're not to be spectators, we're to be participants. And so let us pray. Let us begin to pray and ask the Lord. Maybe some of us, we don't, we, we, you know, I, as far as I know in our church, about the only person who has a spiritual gift is Sue Slate. <laughs> in our church, because Sue's always the one that has tongues, you know. I think, man, there's more than just that. There's more than that. Thank God that Sue steps out in faith and does that. But we all need to step out and be used by God in spiritual gifts. And I think that's probably going to be the next class we do is on spiritual gifts so people can step out in the spiritual gifts. All right, let's go to page uh, 109 now. And let's look at something here. <clears throat> We're on our way to 1 Peter. Okay, but I want to take you through just a couple of verses real quick. And then we're going to go over to 1 Peter. And I want to connect what Isaiah said with what Matthew wrote and then tie it all into 1 Peter chapter 2. Because what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25, it's a summary statement of Isaiah 53. Almost every commentator, everybody points that out. In fact, he quotes from Isaiah 53 over and over right there in those verses. So we know that he's... he's uh, um, drawing from Isaiah 53. And I know you guys have been Christians for uh, a long while. You guys all know that Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, is a prophecy about Jesus. And when he died on the cross, and the sorrows, and all that he went through, the rejection and everything. So, I want to go here because we're going to establish a very, very powerful truth and that is that healing is in the atonement. Healing is in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So again, we're removing it away from it being the apostles and being man's thing. It's something that Jesus did on the cross for us. And so, uh, you, I know that you guys are familiar with these verses, so it would be a great chapter to go home and meditate on because... We see the suffering that Jesus went through for us on our behalf. And what, a, what a, an amazing thing in the love of Jesus that the one who was perfectly innocent suffered everything for the ones who were perfectly guilty. Mm -hmm. And that is an amazing thing because none of us here would put up with that. If I went out here and I drove down the street and I got into a wreck and then I made you pay for it, you wouldn't like that at all. You know, that's totally unjust. Well, multiply that times 100 million, and that's what happened to Jesus. We were the ones that did all the sinning. We were the ones who should have been sentenced to death and eternity to hell away from God. And it was Jesus that took all that punishment, which was undeserved, totally because he was completely sinless and innocent. So we're going to tie that in right now here. But I want to grab something here that's very important. And then we're going to go to Matthew and see how Matthew interprets this. So let's read Isaiah 53 and verse 4. Surely he, Jesus, he's speaking about Jesus. He bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. God smote him. On our, uh, we should have smote us, but he smote him. And he was afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, but it was for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was put on him. And here's the famous statement. And by his stripes or his wounds, we are healed. We all, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want to read verse 7 too because Peter quotes it over there in verse, verse Peter. He was oppressed and was afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. And he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, but he did not open his mouth. Now, <clears throat> I want to tell you this. This is very popular among people who don't believe in healing. Very popular among people like John MacArthur, Baptist churches, a lot of theology. They look at verse 5, and where it says, by his stripes we are healed, 
they say that is only spiritual healing. That is not for your physical body. It's spiritual. It's your soul. Isn't that more important? Your soul. So they say, by his stripes, we are healed. That's not a physical healing. That's a soul, your spirit healing. We're going to show right now why that's false. Okay, so you want to mark this down. Okay, so go. let's go to Matthew chapter 8. And I'm going to show you why that's false statement. Guess what? Matthew quotes from Isaiah 53. And he's going to tell you what that means over there. <laughs> so go to Matthew 8. And let's look at verse uh, 16 and following. In fact, all the, the other verses too are there about he took our infirmities, he bore our sicknesses. He says all of that is soul, is your soul, your spirit, not your physical body. So here in Matthew 8, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him, to Jesus, many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word. And notice it says, and he healed all who were sick. So here Matthew is looking at what Jesus is doing. He's casting out evil spirits. He's healing the people who are sick. Mm -hmm. And notice what Matthew says, that it might be fulfilled what yes. was spoken by Isaiah the right, prophet, right. saying he himself took our infirmities and he bore our sickness. So we have it there. Matthew did not see people getting saved, although maybe these people turned to the Lord. Matthew saw people being healed physically who were sick. And when Matthew saw that, he says, Aha! That is what Isaiah was talking about 700 years ago when he said he himself took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. So we know then that that over there was not just about uh, spiritual healing or soul, your soul being saved, it was about people who were sick. Yes. They got healed. And so the Lord was bearing up our, our uh, sicknesses and infirmities. Okay, so let's go now to 1 Peter chapter 2 and let's tie this all together now that we have that. And let's look starting at verse 21. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 2. So here in 1 Peter, he's going to quote from over there, Isaiah 53, uh, over and over and allude to verses that Isaiah put there in 53. He's going to write them all here in just this little portion from verse 21 down to verse 25. He's quoting from over there. <clears throat> and and uh, this would be a great... Uh, chapter to study, I mean a book actually, to study because it talks about suffering. And like Roberta was saying right now, we're going to suffer. In these next years, we are going to suffer a lot. And he's showing us here how to deal with the suffering that we're going to experience. And a lot of it is going to be undeserved, unjust. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. And now notice he's going to quote from Isaiah 53, verse 9. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So he's quoting directly from Isaiah. And he says, so when he was reviled or insulted, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he made no threats. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. I want to tell you, that is hard to do. When somebody talks or insults you or shames you or puts you down, man, you want to, you want to say something, you know. You want to threaten them. And you say that again, man, I'm going to blow up your car, you know. And it says here, who himself bore our sins on his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For we were like sheep gone astray. Just We just finished reading that in Isaiah. But now you've returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. 
So he's quoting a lot here from Isaiah. All right. So, <clears throat> from the early church fathers to the present day, the words here of 1 Peter 2, verse 21 through 25, uh, are seen as a summary of Isaiah 53. In fact, some are direct quotes right from that chapter. So here's the deal. When you do good and you suffer for it, that is unjust and undeserved suffering. In fact, if you look at verse 20, the verse just before we started here, it says when you do good and you suffer for it, but if you take it patiently, that's commendable before God. You know, when we do good, we should be commended. But they're going to punish us and persecute us and hate us when we do good. So, so he's going to tell you, okay, don't get overwhelmed by this. Let me show you what Jesus went through. <laughs> Let's see what happened to Jesus. So if we follow the world, the flesh, and the devil, we will always lash out. We will always get even. We will always seek revenge and we we'll want to pay back. But the ultimate example, and the word there, example, in verse 21, the Greek word is the underwriter. Literally, literally in Greek, the underwriter. Jesus is going to underwrite this. You guys know that, right? When you get an insurance policy, there's somebody who's going to underwrite it, that's going to pay for it, for there's risk. Jesus is going to take the whole risk of us. He's the insurance policy. He's going to be the example, the underwriter, the hupogramos, Upo means under, gramos means to write. Jesus is going to underwrite everything for us. Isn't that awesome? He's our insurance policy. Man, he's underwriting you. We ought to be praising the Lord for that because we need a good insurance policy when it comes to our salvation and to our sin. But he set an example. He leaves us an example, and it's a Greek participle. He continues to leave us an example. So tomorrow when you go to the store and you're driving there and somebody cuts you off, once again, <laughs> Jesus is their example. You come to church and somebody does something at church you don't like, and you get rid and Jesus is your example. <laughs> and so Jesus now continuously in the life of the Christian, he becomes our example so that now we can follow his footsteps. So um, he's the innocent one suffering for the guilty ones. Wow. <clears throat> How many of you know that if you think you're pretty good, you're not really too big of a sinner, and you're, you're, you're a pretty good guy, you know? Everybody ought to pat you on the back. The one area where we all can really be exposed, it's what's coming out of your mouth. That's where we sin the most, by far. And that shows you just how awesome Jesus is because he committed not a single sin, and he never even sinned with his mouth. That's how you know he's God. Because none of every one of us here, we have failed a million times. If, if, if God gave you a list of how many times you sinned with your mouth, man, it would be a stack of paper to the moon, all of us here, because all of us here have sinned with our mouth. Every one of you. In fact, today, some of you really did it over time. That <laughs> Brothers and sisters, when somebody can be here on planet Earth the whole time and not sin one time with his mouth, he's God. That's who he is. That's what Jesus is. There's no doubt about it. He's God. He did not commit a single sin, nor was any deceit or lie found in his mouth. Jesus Christ is God. That's what, that's what I say right there. But proof that he was God and that he controlled his tongue on top of him already being so awesome when they were insulting him on the way to the cross and they were spitting on him and cursing him. He kept silent. <laughs> man, if I was him, I would have called the Legion of Angels. Like, man, I would have just said, you know what, Lord? This guy right here, this guy that's mocking me right now, just go ahead and take him. Take him out right now. <laughs> he didn't revile. Oh my goodness. When he suffered, he didn't say, you know what? Wait till you I see you on judgment day, man. You're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> no, 
no, no. Isn't that amazing? What did he do? He committed the whole thing over to his father. He says, you know what, father? Those people are mocking me. They're laughing at me. They're spitting at me. But I'm trusting that you're going to judge this all and it's all going to come out all right. And you guys know it wasn't very long after he died, he was raised from the dead. And not very long after that, he's now at the right hand of God in the highest place of the universe. And now who's talking? <laughs> okay, who are the ones down there? That we... <laughs> Here's a lightning bolt for you. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. Thank God he didn't do that. Thank God he didn't do what he could have done to Peter. Thank God that the very same guy that really messed up was the guy who was used on Pentecost and, and, was, and was blessed by God. So, <clears throat> uh, Jesus is awesome. And this is a quote from Isaiah 53. And what a lesson we can all learn when we are insulted and mocked and ridiculed. You guys know, we're on the phone, we're mad. Well, I'm gonna talk to you, I need to talk to you right now, you know? And, hey, <laughs> we've all done this. But it's hard, it is hard when somebody is mocking you to really turn it over to the Lord. Say, Lord, take care of this. And many of us, we fail here. So this is all leading up now to the cross. Verse 23 is leading up to the cross, right? He's being insulted. He's being suffering terribly. He's beaten by these people. Thorns, all that stuff. Now, verse 24, he's actually going to talk about what Jesus did on the cross for us, right? He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Literally Greek, in the tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's why. So that we, having died now to sin, the power of sin is being broken off of us. We're not living in sin anymore. We're living for righteousness yes. now. We live for God. We're not to continue on in our sin. That's not what Jesus died for. We can now live a righteous life empowered by the Spirit. And here's another thing that he did for us on the cross. By whose stripes or wounds you were healed. Awesome. Now, again, somebody says, that healing right there is a spiritual healing. <laughs> this word healing that's used, it's used 25 times in the... Um, it's used 25 different times in the Bible. Where am I at here? I already talked about this one. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. There's 25 times in the New Testament that this word healed is used and guess what every single time it was a physical healing every time there was not a single time that it was spiritually healed or anything like that in fact if you go through the new testament look up any word on healing heals healed heal only maybe one time does it involve a spiritual or a healing of the heart all the other almost 100 times it's a physical healing, okay, that word healed. But this Greek word that's used here was strictly for physical healing. And all the other hundred words or so, they're not, there's only one that I can think of that was a spiritual healing. You remember the Bible says that he came to heal the brokenhearted? Mm -hmm. That's a word for healing. <clears throat> it's for a broken heart, okay? So that was, that's, and that's the only verse I could find out of about a hundred verses. So when you see the word healing, healings, healed or healed, all those involve physical healing, not spiritual healing. So what's our important conclusion here? Physical healing was obtained for us at the cross. Through the atoning work of Christ, we are healed. So physical healing did not pass away or cease when the last apostle died. It was purchased for us at the cross. In fact, why do we have communion? Why do we have two elements? Right? right? right. There's a cup that represents the blood of Jesus that forgives us of all of our sins. <coughs> and then there's bread that is broken because his body was broken for our healing. 
So you have a spiritual healing and you have a physical healing. That's why we have both elements in communion. It wasn't just for the soul. It was for the whole man. Spirit, soul, and body can be healed because of what Jesus did at the cross. And so we're reminded of this. And I know the church I was at in Ohio, we practice this all the time. Our pastor said, when you break that cracker, if you need healing, pray right here. Let's pray and receive our healing and remember that Jesus purchased our healing for us. And so we remind ourselves of that. So Jesus took our sicknesses, our weaknesses, our diseases, our pain, and every physical element, ailment on his body at the cross, Calvary's cross. And I want to say this is not a Pentecostal doctrine. This is a biblical doctrine. We have confirmed this in Isaiah, in Matthew, and in 1 Peter. And did you notice that Jesus didn't just get a spear stuck in his side? He bled from his head. He bled from his back. He bled from his side. He bled from his hands. He bled from his feet. Just to show that I'm covering the whole body. He got wounded everywhere. And that's why we said earlier when we looked at all those 26 healing miracles, he healed every part of the body, the skin, the back, the legs, the eyes, all that. He healed it. And when he was wounded, he was wounded all over his body. And so our, because we get sick all over this body, you know, so we need that healing. All right, let's read this last section here. We'll close up here. I told you there was a lot of verses on healing here in, in the New Testament, and we're not, I, I just can't cover all of them, but I just wanted to highlight the main ones here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and let's read here. Paul was so upset with these Galatians. He was really angry, and he was angry at the people who were deceiving them, and boy, he was hot. You read Galatians, man, he was mad. He says, oh, you foolish Galatians. And I'm not exaggerating. The word in Greek, a, nu, ea, it's a word that means basically you have no brain. I'm serious. It's the word to not have a mind. You don't have a mind. You don't have a brain. He said, you guys are clueless and brainless. That's what he was saying to them. You're absolutely, you are without a clue. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Jesus crucified is the message of Galatians. is Jesus crucified. That's your salvation. That's your healing, everything. Mm -hmm. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now... Seeking to be made perfect by the flesh? Mm -hmm. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and who works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Let's just keep reading here. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you, all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Amen. Over and over, he's going to use the word faith, 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 faith. How are you saved? By faith. How are you healed? By faith. How is the gospel preached? By faith. How do people become sons of Abraham and sons of God? By faith. Now, this whole chapter here, chapter 3, is full of faith. So, I like what John Stott said in uh, his book on Galatians. He says, this is the difference between them. The law says, do this. But the gospel says, Christ has done it all. Mm -hmm. The law requires works of human achievement. The gospel requires faith in Christ's achievement. The law makes demands and bids us to obey. But the gospel brings promises and bids us to believe. Yes. I love that. So it's not a matter of how much more you can do. No, God has already done it and he's given us a promise yes. and now it's on us to believe yes. that promise. The word faith is mentioned 14 times in chapter 3 alone. 
Galatians, the Galatians did not receive the Spirit, nor did God work miracles among them because of their good works, the law, self-effort, the flesh, or willpower. It all came by the hearing of faith. So as we hear from the Lord about how to receive our healing or receive salvation or whatever, then we need to act on that. Paul was shocked at how the Galatians had deserted from Christ and his gospel. He says, you foolish Galatians, you're so foolish. Is all of this in vain? He says it twice there in verse 4. So verse 2, where he says, did you receive the Spirit? That's talking about how they received. And in verse 5, it says, he who supplies the Spirit. That's what God did. So he's asking them, did you guys receive the Spirit? And how did God supply you the Spirit? Both cases, it was by faith. We received the Spirit by faith, and God supplied it because we believe by faith. So, all through Galatians, of course, he says the promise of the Spirit is through faith. We are all sons of God through faith. And then he goes on, he says we're justified by faith. We live by faith. The promise is by faith. The hope of righteousness is by faith. Everything for Paul here to the Galatians is by faith, and it's not by works. I like J.B. Phillips. He says, oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. Surely you can't be idiotic. Another translation says, how foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Wow. You began your life in Christ with the Spirit. Now do you try to complete it by your own power? This is foolish. See, he says, how can you be so stupid? You do not think that by your, do you, do you think that by yourself you can complete what God's Spirit started in you? Wow, what statements Paul is saying. He said, man, when you started out in the Holy Spirit, it wasn't because of the law. It wasn't because of your self-effort. It was because of faith in God. You put your faith in God and God began to do that. I like the Living Bible. And I found this, this little cartoon thing right here with an empty head. And, and like Floor likes to say, hello, hello, right? Floor, Floor likes to say hello when, yeah. you, when yeah. you're clueless. And, and Floor recognizes that. She says, hello, right? So it says, that, then he says, have, <laughs> then have you gone completely crazy? For if trying to obey the Jewish laws never gave you spiritual life in the first place, why do you think that trying to obey them now will make you stronger Christians? You can't become stronger by the law or by the works of the law or by trying to impress God. Hello, you're clueless. You don't have a brain. <laughs> you cannot be perfected in the things of God. God gives it to you. <laughs> by the Holy Spirit and by His grace. So we want to focus here just for a moment on verse 3. We're moving here to an end here. The works of the Spirit, even miracles, occur because you believe. Not because you believed in the past, but because you believe. Do you see that? He says, how does God supply the Spirit to you? How does God, He works miracles among you. That's not past tense. How did He do it? It didn't say, did He supply the Spirit or He worked miracles? No. How is He, in fact, Paul is writing right there. He's saying, how is He doing it right now? Right now when He was writing this letter, how is He working miracles among you? How is He doing it right now? So these are present tense participles of continuous action. They're happening right now. It's not of the past. It's something that was going on with the Galatians right then. One translation says, does God give you the Spirit because you follow the law? Does God work miracles among you because you follow the law? No. God gives you His Spirit and He works miracles among you because you heard the message about Jesus and you believed it. That's what it is. So we, and when we're talking about authority, you know, we've been talking a lot about authority, right? And, 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 and power. But we must never discount the importance of faith in believing and trusting and putting our faith in the Lord. And I want to say to you, maybe, maybe on Sunday mornings when we gather together, 
rather than just praying for good worship, we want that. Rather than praying for the pastor to preach a good message, we want that. Maybe we ought to start praying for miracles. Maybe we ought to start coming and praying and saying, God, do miracles here. You're working among us. It's a matter of faith. Do we believe that you are able to do miracles? Surely we do. These verses here, I'm not going to go through them, but there are other gift, miracles, of the, uh, scriptures that talk about signs and wonders and miracles and things that Paul did. And, and again, Hebrews there, there, Hebrews talks about how does God bear witness to this, this great salvation that we have received? How are we going to escape if we neglect this great salvation? He says, the Lord spoke to us about it. The apostle spoke to us about it. And now God is speaking to us about it by signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Even now today, God is showing you how great that yes. salvation that Jesus purchased for us by the miracles that are being done. Yes. Last slide. We'll close with this one here. So, as people who believe, we're going to find verses like these. <laughs> and what we might want to do is, let's, let's hope people, nobody reads these verses. Because, <laughs> because we've been talking about healing, and if somebody reads this verse, they're going to have doubt and unbelief. No, can I tell you, I'm glad these verses are in the Bible. And I'm not going to avoid them. They're there. And we need to embrace the fact that they're there. And actually, I'm relieved that they're there. Because there's many times I've prayed for sick people and they didn't get better. And guess what? Paul left Trophimus and Miletus. He left him there sick. And I look at that. I'm not happy for Trophimus. And Trophimus was probably not happy. <laughs> but you know what? A guy as great as we all think the Apostle Paul was. Somehow this man was not here. He left him there sick. Why? The Bible doesn't tell us. But at least it brings Paul down to our level. <laughs> and at least we don't have to be discouraged when we see this. That he left Trophimus there. Why? We don't know. I don't know why he left Trophimus. It doesn't tell us. It just said he left him there sick. You would think a guy like Paul who wrote this and did miracles right. and was an apostle. You would think, man, right now, get up and let's go to work. He left him there sick. <laughs> and for me, it's a little bit of a comforting because sometimes I pray, many times I pray and people don't get healed. There's another verse here. 1 Timothy 5.23 Timothy, stop drinking water only. Go ahead and drink a little bit of wine. This will help your stomach and you will not be sick so often. Timothy had a weak stomach and he told him, don't just drink water, drink a little bit of wine. Oh, he can be what? healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so we see here that wine had a medicinal purpose, right? It was a medicine back then. He didn't have Kaiser. He didn't have insurance. He didn't have anything. So, hey, Matt, drink a little bit of wine. Thank God he said a little bit, all right? Don't, don't yeah. overdo it. Don't take the whole bottle, all right? Just drink a little bit. It'll help your stomach. And then the one that people use is the one about the thorn in the flesh. They say that was a sickness. And we know that that's false. And that's why I gave you that teaching so you can read it. We know what the thorn in the flesh was. He says it right there, right? It's a messenger of Satan. The word for messenger there is angelos. It's the main word for angel. So a demon spirit came against Paul and tormented, buffeted him, beat him, was beating on him. Uh, and that's what was the thorn in the flesh. It was not a sickness. It was a spirit. And, of course, he wasn't possessed by any kind of spirit or anything like that, obviously, only the Holy Spirit. But that's what the thorn in the flesh was. It was a messenger of Satan. Okay, so we don't avoid these verses. They are in the Bible, and we must deal with them. Don't avoid them. They're right there. You've got to deal with them. So never live in 
denial. You can live in De Mississippi, but don't live in denial. Right? <laughs> you live in denial, you're going to drown. But never live in denial. This happened, and we must deal with it.